The hospital is a little different late at night on a Friday night. Usually in the daytime, there's people walking all over the place. There's pages overhead, visitors, doctors, patients, nurses, people transporting, getting all kinds of tests. It's hustle bustle like a train station almost, if you will. At nighttime, it's a different place. The halls are completely empty, it's quiet. So Friday night we were getting together as a family. It was just a routine Friday night dinner, having dinner. Towards the middle of the entree, I got a phone call that someone was having a heart attack in the ER. I had to abruptly leave dinner, then headed off to the ER. Get to the hospital, I was obviously in street clothes, so I had to switch into my scrub in my office. Doctor, I have a very high blood pressure, 165 over 160. Okay. And it's going down to 165 over 110, 160 over 110, and my sores are very tight. I feel like I'm jittery. I'm just doing an emergency shortly at St. Francis, but if you don't feel good, if you want to come to the ER, I'll see you there when I'm done with the emergency. Or you could try taking the blood pressure pill and see if that makes it better and call me back. Are you having any chest pain or shortness of breath? No, no chest pain. Just my joints locking up. Maybe I'm nervous or something. I'm sure you are. Why don't you take a little salt now? You have my cell phone. You can call me anytime. I'll be at the hospital. And if you don't feel better, you could just come to the ER. Okay? So, 24 hours a day, phone calls. And you have to figure out if it's real or is it not? Is it anxiety or is it a heart attack? 10 or 6, not bad. It gets bad at 3 in the morning. That's when it's bad. Because I have to start work at 5, so you don't get much sleep. This is a patient who was in another hospital and she was waiting in the ER there and they weren't doing anything. So she and her husband left the ER and actually drove over themselves. She was having chest pain. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? Uh, not much history, just hypertension, high cholesterol, high cholesterol high hyper. today, hyper. Hypertension? Uh, chest pain started at eight. It was uh, at um, like three o'clock this morning. EKG. And her EKG showed what we called a tombstone uh, T waves. Her EKG was markedly abnormal. She was in the throes of a heart attack. Her pressure was low. She was really uncomfortable and not looking that great. Hello, Karen. My name is Dr. Shockley. You do? Well, let's find out what's going on. I'm going to look right now. Yes, sir. Congratulations. All right. And by the time I got there, she was prepped on the table and quickly looked at two of her arteries, which are normal, but one of her main arteries was closed in the beginning of the artery. So the LED, the right's closed, the LED and circle, okay. Just move the cameras out a little for me, please. More pressure's good. How are you feeling, honey? Is it a video seven startup? Yeah. 12, semi-compliant. Okay, hon. So when I'm talking to her, I'm trying to relax her, but I'm really focused on what I'm doing. You may feel better soon. Here, watch her arrhythmia work for yeah. us. Let's balloon. It's like a ballet, basically. The staff's amazing. It's everything just happens every second. They know exactly what move I'm making, and speed is important. Yet accuracy is more important, and we're handling things back and forth. FCs are getting better. Three, five, thirty-eight. Watch the rhythm. It looks like she's in a fib now. Got it. Okay. Three, five, thirty-eight. Stand. We're making progress. The pain should be getting a little better. Daughter balloon. If you can note that. Talk about something called daughter balloon. That's the time someone comes in with a heart attack and hits the ER door till we get them up to the cath lab and open up the closed artery because time is muscle, and the quicker you open up someone's artery the less damage it's done. The more the arteries close, the less chance that the heart goes back to normal. That's the door closed right there. Now we're going to take a picture with it open. I have that. Now it's wide open. We have reperfusion. The vessel's open. I have the stent in. Let's get some um, Advertac going in. We're going to give it some carbine and we'll sit back and see what's going on. And we got it open and our door to balloon was like 12 minutes, which you want to be under 90 minutes. 
So as soon as we get that balloon open, her pain improved, the blood pressure improved, and then we went ahead and put stents in and optimized using our imaging to get a great result. And everything was fine. She did great. And when I looked at her heart function, fortunately, literally no damage was done. It actually looks great. We're good. Let's do a big gram and then we'll close up. Karen, everything's fine. We got the artery open. It looks really good. If it's good. Saturday 2 in the morning, no staff's in around, that could take 30 minutes to get everyone in. Fortunately, our staff hadn't gone home from their day. Everything's going to be fine. We'll get you home in no time. Really? Yep, you'll be at your grand... Is it a granddaughter or a grandson you're having? No. Your heart's pumping great. Almost no damage. Everything's great. You're in great shape. We're all done. Yeah. He had a heart attack, but it was minimal. What? we interrupted it and we're going to be fine. So this is a situation where if she hadn't come to us, could have had a life-threatening heart attack or certainly significant damage. And we were fortunate enough to be with her and get it open and it was a really happy uh, situation. Should we have room for dessert? So my mother-in-law just passed out in the bathroom. My wife just called me at the restaurant. My mother-in-law just passed out. Can't make this stuff up. So what's crazy is uh, my mother-in-law, we were just out to dinner, and my wife calls me and said, I can't talk to you. I'm in the middle of an emergency, you know? Her mom passed out going to the bathroom. I mean, this happens a lot in the past, and my wife's used to it. And being a doctor's wife, she's sort of like a, a deputized doctor. So she took care of the whole thing, and her mom's fine. This happened in the past. I don't know if they're over here, but we'll family. Mr. Corrigan? Right here. In 12 minutes, we got the artery open, which is critical. When I took a picture of the heart pumping, it was pumping normally, so she didn't have any damage. And the other two arteries were normal, so we put a nice dent in. Mr. Corrigan? No. During the daytime, we always speak to families immediately after, and sometimes people don't know how long a procedure is going to take. And when you're in a hospital, things don't happen immediately, so people get nervous waiting around. I went to the waiting area where people normally wait, but he didn't know where to go. He wasn't up here before, so there was no staff to guide you. And then I went to the ER security. I went to the front of the hospital, and I called a couple of cell phones, but I couldn't find him. So apparently, um, he went home. She was uh, I'm not in the ER, but not in the ER, so, and I called the cell phone, there's no answer. And Topol 25, please. Zero to 15, and then we're just going to come here, yeah. Topol 25? Yep. And she's doing okay? She's doing okay, yeah, otherwise she's doing okay. Fantastic. All right, and okay. we'll get a step down. You guys are okay? You call me if you need anything. Yeah, I'm waiting for our bed. Thank you very much. Okay. She should be able to go home tomorrow, live a normal life. She's had some grandchildren. And uh, happy ending. We get to do it all over again. So you sleep whenever you can. You know, uh, I could sleep standing up if I had to. Because I get called every night. I take calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And somebody calls, the answer. <laughs>
beats, it torques, and then it did this, and my valve popped off, and it was really, really bad. It was, it, you know, it should have killed me. But then, like, every doctor I ran into after that was exactly who it needed to be, that I was, they, I came here, and a doctor canceled his day to do my surgery and saved my life. It was a long surgery, but I'm very, very lucky. Really lucky. So Alicia is a 37-year-old young woman who was referred to me from a cardiologist in Suffolk County a number of years ago. And she was referred to me because her heart function had started to decline slightly. Um, and as a result of all of that and the amount of scar tissue in her heart, she's had a number of arrhythmias. She has a defibrillator. She had valve surgery. She has a mechanical valve. One of her valves is mechanical, so she takes Coumadin every day and her ejection fraction is somewhere about 40 to 45 percent, which means her heart is working about two-thirds of normal. So the procedure we're doing today is called CardioMEMS. Okay. It's a device that sits inside the pulmonary artery. It's used for us to measure your pressures every morning to tell us before you start having heart failure symptoms. Okay, to stay on top of it from where you are. Exactly, to prevent you from getting symptoms of heart failure. All right. Okay, so the way the procedure goes is we're gonna go in the right groin, we're gonna numb up the groin with some lidocaine, we're going to put a catheter into the groin, up into the heart. We're gonna measure the pressures inside the heart to tell us what your heart failure looks like right now. Okay. Um, we're gonna go into your left pulmonary artery. That's where the device is gonna be left into. Okay. At the end of the procedure, we're gonna lay you down on a plastic piece that's gonna tell us how to calibrate the device. Okay. So the numbers I get on the catheter are gonna be the same numbers I want to be on the capacitor that's okay. inside your body. Okay. And then when you come out over here, we're gonna do a reading with your own pillow before you go home so you feel very comfortable using the device. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how, how was my CPAP? Good. Good. Okay. You did really, really well on it. We recommended this procedure today because she's had a lot of symptoms of shortness of breath lately that really caused her a lot of distress in her life. She's done really, really well though. She's fully functional. She lives with her husband at home. They have a really good life. They travel. Um, and she's very happy with her quality of life. So we're hoping this device continues to add to that. And now we have a good baseline. Yeah. Yeah, to go by. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. My first child. It's waiting. You never know when it's going to happen. So it definitely makes things difficult for scheduling, but. She thinks it's every day. <laughs> every day she thinks is gonna be the day, so. I think it'll be this weekend. So I'm gonna be seeing Mr. O'Connor, a longtime patient of mine and my father's. He's coming for follow-up after a recent procedure. He opened up one of the blockages in one of his coronary arteries. That had been done by my father most recently. How are you, Mr. O'Connor? How are you? Hi, Doc. Good to see you. How are you doing? How have you been? Fine, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure, Doctor. I have something for you. This I don't know if you saw this, but this was in the newspapers. And this is you and your wonderful father. The Father's Day special. I, I recognize oh, I them. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much. And you know, it. Your family is like part of our extended family. Thing. Oh, we feel the same, and we wouldn't be here without your yeah. father and you. Uh, as you know, I had bypass years ago. And uh, somehow or other, those grass somehow uh, co uh, occluded. And uh, your dad took care of me with stents. And you, most recently, thank you, yep. took care of me with angioplasty. <laughs> and and the, he took care of my wonderful wife. That's important, too. And, so. well, he discovered that she had a valve problem. And well, he not to have done that. We thought it was an ear problem. And uh, my ears or something like that. Right. Your dad gave her copious test, discovered that she had a problem, and she, you know, he brought in a doctor to take care of her. Thank you. That's great. Now, God bless you. Glad you guys are doing well. Always great yeah, to yeah, see yeah. you. And how, uh, since the most recent procedure, how have you been feeling? Pretty good. Pretty good. Let me pull up the picture so you could see what we did that day. Ooh. You see right there, it's not filling with contrast. Oh, okay. uh -huh. So right there, it's not filling with contrast, and that's because that's where plaque and scar tissue is, and that's inside one of the old grafts, inside an area that we've treated previously with a stent. Uh -huh. So that's what was causing your chest pain. You weren't getting enough blood flow to that whole wall of the heart that that yeah. vein graft was supplying blood to. 
And this is here the balloon that's opening up the blockage, expanding the blockage. So that's right after we open up that blockage, you see that this is that same area and the contrast is filling. And if contrast can go there, that means blood could go there. Mm -hmm. Now your heart muscle is getting enough oxygen. And that of course is your your device, which is uh, making sure that your heart's... It's that big? Yeah. <laughs> Look at the size of that, that's right. It's still on the job. Yep, that's your, that's your, that's your defibrillator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's what's always watching you. Everything's good. The kidney function's stable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just the one thing that we have to keep an eye, a close eye on the kidney function yeah. over the next few months. But everything's looking good. Drink a lot of water. Yep, yeah, it's important to stay hydrated. Let me see here. Deep breath in or now? Looks good. Let's see here how the swelling is. It's great. Not bad. Not bad. Thank <laughs> you. Looking pretty good. God bless the family. Thanks, and thanks so much for bringing that in. That's Let great. us know if any good news comes. Definitely. Through. I think any day now. Thank With a lot of patients have noticed little detail. <laughs> As I'm sure you notice, he always has, he's always, he always has an earpiece and always on a phone call. So <laughs> even during the interview, he's taking phone calls as patients all are, it's a 24 seven thing where people are always getting in touch with him. So he always has an earpiece in. So we can take the full steel balloon, the floral, yeah. please? Uh, first floor, please. We have all these tools to be able to measure pressure in the heart and also to look at the artery from the inside using these uh, very sophisticated cameras. And so we have these group of patients, the ones who have chronic kidney disease, who have a very high risk if you give them contrast, specifically some, the patients with really bad kidneys, the contrast gets stuck in the kidneys and it can end up putting them on dialysis. I developed a technique where you can actually put in these stents where you don't use any contrast at all. And that's what we did in this patient. And so there are very few centers around the country that do that. Certainly very few centers that have a dedicated program. We have a dedicated cardiorenal program here because we have a high patient population with dialysis. We, we are done. Uh, I know I told you it was gonna be a lot to fix everything. It was a lot. Well, we did a really, we got a really nice result. I'm very really happy with it. That looks great. Um, and we fixed all the blockages in your arm. It really allows us to focus on the needs of kidney patients, which are quite different. You know, we don't put defibrillators in all the patients. So we have specialists in electrophysiology, preventative care, heart failure, interventional cardiology, general cardiology, who really focus on this specific patient subgroup. Um, and treat them differently. And I think that's important. Do, you know, the cases can be a little longer, but, uh, you know, we got a really meaningful result. And the number one thing this gentleman was concerned about was, he said, you can basically do anything to me. Don't put me on dialysis. And uh, I feel pretty comfortable or not. So we're, we're in good speed. You brought lunch? I brought lunch, guys. You're such a gentleman. I mean, he, the, you know what? He really is a gentleman. First, he, you know, he, he scrums with me for the case, helps me out. Oh, they're, they're trying to reach me about my car's auto insurance. <laughs> Does anybody want Wait, it? No, no, those are for cost. Can you, can you, can you, let me, let me give you, hang on. Dr. Alan Jeremias. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it, yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes I just feel so lucky that every, they keep calling me. I forget, they call me back. I forget, <laughs> there's a great app. How are you? I'm Dr. Robinson. Doctor, how are you? Nice to meet you. And Mary Ann. Nice to meet you both. And uh, thanks for sharing yourself with us today. Tell me what kind of trouble you've had. Really, no trouble at all. Okay. I went to see my cardiologist. My cardiologist. And uh, he's been monitoring me for years and right. years. I, I, I have a heart murmur. So he was doing what, echoes? Yes. And he says he, he thinks we should go a little further. He says with the with the valve in there. Yeah, this is Mr. Sampson's uh, CAT scan. Um, he has uh, he has aortic stenosis. He's had some shortness of breath, also um, coronary disease, and uh, was cath last week by Dr. Schlockmitz. Was treated with a stent. 
uh, and now he's here to speak with me about the possibility of tavering, a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So what you can see here is the calcification uh, at the uh, commissures leading down into the, into the leaflet edges. The aortic valve normally opens and closes freely. With calcification of the leaflets, uh, what happens is that they don't open or close as efficiently. I can show you this. So if, if, this, is a, if this is a normal valve, see, and the leaflets, there are normally three, and these leaflets are, will, will open and close very easily. Oh yeah, it's so, sure. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like this then when it opens and, and blood right. flow can freely go from the left ventricle into your aorta. If, if it has calcium on it, it's more like this one, which you can feel that. It's just not as easy to oh, put your finger through that, right? Oh, yeah. That's the way your valve is. Very densely calcified. Normally the leaflets here, this is the aorta, the outline of the aorta. This is the sinuses in the aorta uh, and calcification of the leaflets here and here, especially on this leaflet, bulky calcium uh, consistent with aortic stenosis. Uh, and of course with a tavern, you know, you come in one day and you leave the next. The valve <coughs> is what we call superannular. It sits up above the level of where your valve is. Even though we push it to your valve in behind it, the valve itself is located above, so we can get a little bit larger valve in per valve with this particular valve. And that mesh will just push the old valve out of the way. Out of the way. Okay, you see the calcium down here. We want to stay away from that, because if we get into that, the uh, insertion site could be a problem in closing the artery at the end of the case. So we want to get into this smooth area. So we look forward to seeing you when you come in. I'll see you Friday. Okay. He's doing okay. I mean, I've mentioned that I'm a, a cancer survivor. I think when he went through that, I think that was harder for him than what he's going through now. I find watching him go through this, I think is harder than when I went through the cancer. I don't know why, but it's, I have, I think illness is worse on the family than it is on the one who's got, who has the illness. Because you have to watch it. And you can't do anything. You can't do a damn thing to make it go away. Get him out of here. picture. She put Farrah Force in shape. Now, come on, look at that. Right. That was a long time ago. One day we all brought in our photos from the 80s. It was a very different time. You know, it was just a long time ago and we were all showing our photos. I know, I know, it was a while ago. I've been here in the cath lab for 20 years. I've been in St. Francis 26 years. It was the first and only hospital I applied to. So when I got the job, I had planned to stay here three years and then I went into the move down to the ER and did that for three years and then I came up here and stayed. So we do have a lot of fun up here. But yet when things need to happen and things change for sometimes the worse, it goes immediate into react and do something. Am I gonna be like up at all? Let's do this right now. Like watch the the internet. Are you doing it? Rachel Nicoletti birthday is eleven three eighty three. Comes in today for cardio mem's procedure with uh, Rita Jermaine. History includes aortic dissection, cabbage, mitral valve repair, right mitral valve replace. No, Melissa would be here say, though. Where's I Melissa? <laughs> I was in her first angiogram with La Mandola. Oh my god. The one the emergency where, one. I, you, yeah, the, it yes. was, but it was a big deal. There were a lot of us here. Yeah, a lot. It was yeah. it was because it was just so not our normal. Right. Right. And um and you were so young. I got chills, she got chills. She was, I was like, I was here 15 years ago. 
I was like, I was in the procedure with you. She truly had a dissection. She probably shouldn't have lived. There wasn't a dry eye in this place. I wonder from time to time, I've wondered about you. You've gone on with your life. You've lived yeah. your life. Your sisters have lived their lives. I could cry thinking about it. When I first came to St. Francis after my car accident 15 years ago, she was in that emergency angiogram where they went in and they saw how severely damaged my heart was. So then when all of a sudden you're faced with somebody who's just as happy to see me as I go into a procedure as I am to see her, it, it helps you remain grateful. The reason we go into medicine to make a difference even when you, you're not sure that you can, even when a person who's young and healthy and shouldn't have anything wrong with them. And we were like, wow, we saved this girl's life. And it, it kind of, again, made you realize that, you know, life is precious. And in a moment, no matter if you're young and healthy and driving along and minding your own business, it can change. It's funny, it was actually the night, the night before I was on my way home and there was this horrible accident on the expressway. I mean, to the point where helicopters, everything. And I remember texting everybody and saying, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? And I heard back from everybody that they were okay. And I was like, okay, good got home, went to sleep, got up in the morning, and I put the traffic report on News 12. There was an accident, and that was it. Never never occurred to me. It wasn't anywhere near where I thought anyone would be. So I guess it's like that cliche that every mother dreads when that phone call comes. She said she couldn't speak, and I said, well, I'm her mother. She could speak to me. They're like, no, you need to get here right away. And then the doctor turned out to be Dr. Massiello. He pulled me aside, and he said, her heart is not connected. So I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what did you just say? He said, her heart is not connected. He said, we're moving her. I said, can I please go in the, in the ambulance with you? And they said, yes, you can. So they told us St. Francis was taking her. And uh, before we left, I went to the ladies' room. Then I remember I collapsed on the floor thinking, how was I gonna tell her sisters that she was dying? So we get here and uh, they whisk her through and I went in and did the uh, admitting. We were waiting in the lobby and then they, they called us. We went into the room where she was and I said, you can go right, go right to her. So I went right to her and I held her hand and I, she was so cold. She was wrapped in blankets and she was so cold. And um, I said to her, I said, sweetie, you've been in a car accident, but it's okay, you're gonna be okay. Everybody here is gonna help you get better. And she was just, I don't understand, I'll be okay. And then at that point, they got ready to whisk her into surgery. And it was like out of a TV show where they're saying, talk to them, yell at them, say something to them. I'm having open heart surgery. What? That's ridiculous. And she's like, no, she is. I'm like, what do you mean she's having open heart surgery? Like, nothing. Nothing made sense. After hours and hours and hours, I don't even know how many, six, seven, eight hours, we get the call to go meet the doctor and they take you upstairs and Dr. Lemondola was there. And, but I remember him describing the damage to her heart. He said it was thrown up again and he's making all the gestures, thrown up against a cement wall. And he told us everything he did, the perforation here, this there, the valve, everything. And then he turned to us and he said, I know I've scared you, but now I want to tell you she's going to be okay. So when they finally took the tube out the next day, the first word she said to me was, did I kill anyone? That's all she cared about was somebody else, did she hurt somebody else? Not the fact that she's laying there, you know. Um, I reaffirmed my faith a lot. <laughs> um, I made a lot of promises to God when I was here that those nights when she was in the hospital and uh, I put my trust in him and St. Francis and uh, my daughters. My daughters are remarkable. So many ups and downs, obviously more ups because she's still with us and she's remarkable, but it's, it's, it's never ended since that day. It's, there's never been a day where there hasn't been an issue or a, a procedure or, or an implant or something. She was able to have a life, um, is it the life she expected? No, but it's a great life and we have to be so grateful for that because she shouldn't be here. Her heart was not connected from five o'clock in the morning until, I don't know, 11 o'clock when they took her into surgery. Who, who can survive that? At least it. The wife looks good, and um, 
She should have a good outcome with this. She'll be able to use this the rest of her life. She's good. I think that case was the reason that, that people go into medicine. I'm so glad that I got to be in this procedure with her. The fact that she's alive and was able to have that procedure. The good news is her pressures actually look pretty normal. So that's really reassuring. So she's in recovery right now. She's gonna go back to the room in about a half an hour. They're pulling the sheath out of her groin. And then um, her INR is 2.2. So she'll go back on her regular. You know, life is challenging for everybody. It's challenging in a special way for me, but if life wasn't challenging, we wouldn't celebrate birthdays or anniversaries or the end of a work week. You know, sometimes the reason that life is great is because life isn't always that great. <laughs> and you know, you make it through a day and that's, that's what life is. Uh, I, I don't know how you have time to raise money for anything. You are the busiest man I've ever met in my life. Third generation uh, physician in the family. It goes against nature. They're supposed to bury us. We're not supposed to bury them. They played it like an orchestra. <laughs> yeah. they, they played it well. <laughs> and that's because I'm here to tell you my story. Oh.